on that first map. You stole my word there, Beach Time. Dominant, absolutely dominant display coming out from EDG. And we're jumping right into Champion Select right here. I hope M3 have had some time to discuss strategy, go for something different, because the pick comp, I like what they were thinking, but once they opted into that Tristana, once they opted into maybe delaying their power spike to late game, EDG make sure late game never comes. Yeah, we've hopped right into it. Like you mentioned, EDG on the blue side, M3 on the red. They've swapped around here for their second game in the best of two. John Alessandra and Cassidy, the three men's there for EDG, and Rek'Sai Javan with one to go for Master 3. And you have to worry that if Nara is left open here again, Pastry Time, Koro is going to snap it up. It wasn't even a decisive Nara victory. You wouldn't really say that Koro was the key to his team's victory. But having that string in your bow is too much for EDG, I'd have to say. That's actually what I wanted to point out. Uh, is, yeah, you're right. Corey just had not a bad performance, but just not not a stellar one. He did his job. He teleported at certain times, was there to team fight, but it wasn't the super high impact Mega Nar plays we've seen from Koro. And that still didn't matter as Rumble's the last band here, so the Nar is now open. One of the exciting things about EDG this season is that we've seen the development of carries across the board. Before it was just how hard will Nar make carry? How much can Kill Love do in the late game team fights? It was all focused on the late game, specifically Nami. It was a very Nami focused team. And now we move to a situation where we're surprised that Koro, someone who'd been mostly overlooked as a top laner, surprised he didn't carry, surprised he didn't have a massive role. And when you have the potential in the mid lane of Pawn, when you have that AD carry and Deft, you have so many different roles and so many different players that can carry. It tells you how much EDG is coming on as a team, not just in China, but in the world, when they have legitimate carries across the board, just like another team, Samsung White did. They did something pretty good here in some tournament called the World Championship. Something like that, right? It was months ago, right? It's over. <laughs> yeah, totally irrelevant. Here is EDG. Now I have Nara as their first pick, just like you predicted. So Korra's going to get that again. You might have seen me shaking my head as, whoa, Volibear Corky right in for M3. We're going to change it up. And I'm excited to see the Volibear, but we've seen, especially Looper, try out some real non-meta picks. You know, he tried the cannon last game, trying to get that back in. That didn't really make the difference. The Annie top was... Uh, a push too far, let's say. That, that really didn't work. It seems like every time Nar comes out, they keep giving away Nar and then being like, all right, what works here? Let's start. Uh, Annie? That didn't work. Uh, Cannon? Nope. Like, is, is it going to be the top lane? It's not 100% sure, but it's going to be top or jungle, you'd have to say, unless we see the solo queue special, the uh, Volibear support. Well, Cliff's going to go with Nunu again, and Pawn's going to get Azir this time around, so strong picks there. I like that you mentioned a bit of Volibear here, because the one player that has played Volibear in the LPL historically is actually Clear Love. So, of course, you're referring to a very famous game, if, if you do have time, look it up, where it was the AP Scion and Volibear jungle combination from World Elite a few years ago that just dominated. It's many moons ago, probably not going to see quite the same flavor come out here, but... Uh, Definitely, it'll be a clear love champ. But we could see, and of course, Dreams could take it into the jungle zone. There is Row, of course. They haven't changed jungles or anything. It is just an ID swap around. So it was one of his older IDs, I believe. Chinese players do like to change their IDs from time to time. Sort of reflects their mood in some ways and how they're feeling. We know Loveling famously was changing his name back and forth because it helped him as a player. And that's just one of the tenets of the LPL that's kind of interesting is players do like to trick us from time to time. And as we see the lobby being remaked here, I actually got the full story on the Loveling uh, change. Of course, he was Loveling before Lin was, I believe, his love interest at the time. That didn't work out. He's now Loveling, which I believe translates to love thyself or love myself. So showing a little bit of emotional growth right there, but still the excellent player, the excellent aggressive jungler that we've always known. Well, a marked improvement from Alan, I think, which is at one point one yes. of his ideas. And uh, yeah, that is Ro there, Dreams on the M3 side. So lineup still the same here. Look decent, definitely had some flashes of brilliance there in game one, but as you said it, just compositionally, they picked something and they never really felt like they executed. And look, M3, you know, previously WE Academy, such a new roster, of course, they did have a few preseason tournament games, but the one thing you can say about them is there's been flashes of brilliance from everyone on that team. Even like the uh, underappreciated bot lane, Candy and Love CD. They've looked really good. Candy and some of the victories has actually been very impressive. Looper on Singed has looked very good. He's done some interesting things on that champion when he's gone to one of his favorite champions of days past. Dade's had some good games on Azir. And Ro had at least one snowball game. So they do have the potential. You can see what would happen if they got it all going on the rift at the same time. That just hasn't happened right there. They don't look practiced. They don't look like they have winning strategies and they don't look like they know what to do when the enemy team is super decisive in the mid game. Whenever we see the wards coming out of a team and the pick star and the neutral objective snowball, you're never sitting there thinking, all right, M3 are going to get back into this game in two, three, four minutes. They need to be winning significantly early and even then they struggle to close out games. So they're going to have a hard time if they want to start to assault these top places, but 
the talent's there. It's just getting it all on the rift at the same time. And if M3's issue maybe is a an overflow of talent but not quite there in the execution, EDG might be the opposite. Not to say their players aren't talented. That's certainly not true. But their most impressive thing for this team especially has been that teamwork. And that was on display in game one. Yeah, they do still seem very centered on pawn or deft carrying. They do, they're do. they happy to go to protect the deft. Uh, but of course, pawn has been playing so well that they haven't had to pigeon the hole themselves as a one-threat comp. But they, those two threats are so strong. And when Korra gets the right champion, Na is definitely one of those champions. He's a carry in the top lane too. So they are playing to their strengths. Clearlove and uh, Mako are able to play that supportive role. And with carries like that in form, which is what you can say about them, you could say... Def Dada and Looper, definitely similar in terms of top and mid lane carries, but not in form. But in form carries on EDG, that's what's propelled them to potentially the first place to spot at the end of this weekend. Yeah, we are back into the champs like Zoe did remake the lobby, but it seems like everything's flying through. So just as a refresher, EDG on the left, banning out Jana, Lissandra, and Cassidy. M3 over on the red side, banned out Rek'Sai, Javan, and a Rumble. EDG going to first pick. Now, this should be Corky. Annie, actually. So it looks like that first pick may not have been Volibear. Yeah, maybe that was a placeholder. Of course, it's been communicated, so we'll just have to go with what's being picked now. It makes a lot more sense, the Annie. Uh, we've already heard very interesting stories out of the LPL in terms of picks and bans. We heard that OMG, the reason they didn't ban uh, Zerath against Snake was because they couldn't find Zerath. Uh, little kind of amusing things like that do happen sometimes on the Chinese client, but look, they've locked in Annie. Makes a lot more sense. Does have that... I mean, this is M3, so this could be in any role, let's be real here, but uh, probably going to be a mid or a support Annie. Well, we do have some hovers here as well, but uh, Nunu Azir are the picks for EDG. That was the second and third last time, and Zerath Lee in the third and fourth. So M3 picking quite quickly now. And it makes a lot of sense to pick up that Zerath against the Azir. So, of course, Pawn's Azir has been massively strong so far. But to pick up the Zerath, to pick up a very long-range champion that doesn't have to respect that locus of control that the Sand Soldiers provide, Makes sense. You can sit back, you might get denied a bit of CS, but you'll farm out just fine. And Xerath late game, these LPL players especially have been holding so much power with all that AoE damage from the Xerath. Yeah, Protect the Deft is back, by the way. Jinx was the last pick there for De or one of the fourth picks. And Leona is going to come back here. So a bit more aggressive in the support, but a big hyper carry for Deft now. And it's not a true Protect the Com. I mean, Azir is definitely not a supportive champion. He has a supportive ult, theoretically, can be used offensively. We're, of course, ignoring that we have the Nar and, Zer Nar and Azir combo right here for potentially very interesting uh, wall action happening right there. But Deft on Jinx, he's looked really, really strong in this champion. Very strong against Sivir, but it's going to be the Corky matchup right here. So it's probably going to be a lane swap, but once the BF sword comes in, once this, once this uh, Jinx starts getting going, put Deft on a hyper carry, you get consistent results. Yeah, Corky is the last one for Candy. Like you mentioned, a champion he has performed quite well on, but I think Jinx... I mean, lane swaps seem to benefit us so much because for me, she is the AD carry that most benefits from the one item power spike. And uh, speaking of lane swaps and speaking of interesting oh, choices, he did it again, didn't he's he? going to do it again. Looper. I mean, it's almost like he's got a playbook and he's like, guys, trust me, I can beat Nova with this champion. So, okay, we trust you. I was trying to we'll signal you through. to look at that champion set because we talked about it and we thought we were joking, but it's going to be once again the Annie top against Nar. It's been the same matchup both times. It was against the Nar both times. And it's just intriguing to me because, okay, she has a ranged auto. She should theoretically be able to farm fine in either a 1v1 or a 2v2. It's just, how does Annie have a comparable impact to Nar in a situation where she hasn't already gotten, say, two or three AP items? It's not realistically going to be the high burst Annie. In this situation, especially in a lane swap, probably going to have to be the emergency items, whatever she can pick up, maybe a Marilla Nomicon. A Marilla Nomicon Annie just can't compare to one or two tanky item Nar. I mean, at least there's a lot of engage for M3's comps, so they're going to take the pick strategy potentially a lot further now as well. That could be what they're thinking of as well. I mean, it definitely has that. It's a strong laner. It has that pick flavor. I'm just waiting to be convinced. I'm, I'm throwing the gauntlet out to Looper. If you can convince me about the Annie top, I'm happy to talk about it as a flex pick. But every time I mention Annie top as a flex pick, I have to roll my eyes a little bit. I think maybe then we'll see M3 really look for their standard lands because I assume it's a pick that Looper wants to bring into his land against Nar. That's how we seem to pick it. I have to think so. I mean, you can see the theory of having Annie in a 1v2 just because she does have that mana refresh on her Q. She should be able to land fairly safely. Uh, she's very turret diveable, so it's a bit of rise flavor there. But... You have to think it's for a 1v1. That's all we can assume. Yeah, and I wonder if M3 are going to get very aggressive with their early wards as well. Maybe make sure that they can get it. Because again, when you don't secure a lane swap against Jinx, things can go alright. But we are going to get straight into our next game.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, for game two here. EDG are currently up a game here in this best of two. After a very strong performance in game one against M3, we've swapped sides around. EDG on the blue side, M3 over on the red, and we'll see if the Dart 8 Pawn train continues. And Pawn definitely got the upper hand in the first game. And we're going to be looking at this top lane, Annie, once again. This is the second time that we've seen Luca pull out Annie against Nah. He's so on point with his singed picks. You always see Looper pulling out Singed against Malka. He loves that matchup. You have to think he sees something about Annie Nah that we've been missing. I mean, we have to think, and if M3 can secure their standard lanes here, we we'll, might see the Annie top pick for Looper come to fruition. In fact, Cora's going to be here, just harassed back and forth. Looper looking maybe to get some harass down. Does have his Q leveled up already if he wants to get the aggression on early. 39 AP at level 1 there as well with Adoran's ring, so the chances are here, but if EDG want to swap, they kind of have good info now. Worth confirming for our viewers that once again, we are on patch 4.21 here. One easy way is to notice no base gates coming out of those bases, and what that means is that DFG is still available as an item. A very realistic item pick on Annie, definitely a champion that benefits a lot out of boosting up those base damages. Her base damage is so high, her ratio is respectable, but just not quite the same way there. But we see here, I mean, M3 are hanging back. They are looking for very specific lanes. Will it be a jungle follow? Will it be a 1v2? We'll have to wait to see how it comes out. Well, EDG were kind of all grouped up in the mid lane, but they seem to have gotten the better of this swap here. We've got Corky and Thresh towards the top side, and that's going to leave EDG in the 2v1 they presumably wanted. So some decent wards, but not massively far forward. So just some good intuition there from Edward Gaming. Uh, Edward Gaming are a very smart team. We always see OMG invading for early war lane wards, and it's been the much the same flavor here. We see that Jinx and Leona, they are going to take the, uh, the Krugs in the bottom lane. They're going to start there. And in the mid lane, we see the very familiar 1v1. Um, this must be the most uh, frequently picked mid lane matchup in the LPL this season. The long range Zereth against all the control that comes out of the Azir pick. And you mentioned that uh, it is slightly Zereth favored, it seems like, in the matchup, at least how we see it played out. But why exactly is that the case, Papa Smithy? It's all about the range right there. I mean, Azir really harasses short and medium term champions. Whenever he can get a trade in where he puts down a Sand Soldier, gets a few autos, maybe even jumps for an extra auto. It's very hard for other mid laners to be able to trade so strongly, but because Zereth, especially with a few levels in his queue and maybe a Meryl and Omicron or getting some AP going, can clear waves fairly instantly, it's the instant long range wave clear of the Luxes and Zereths of the world that really let Zereth shine in that matchup. Death down the bottom. Being very careful with this wave, just trying to last it as best he can. So looking to get some sort of freeze on, but I think was a bit late. So a slow push, it seems like, will be the trigger there. Instead, Pawn back in the mid. CSing decently. This will be a pretty interesting matchup to continually check in on as we'll see which one can get the upper hand. Pawn definitely got ahead of Dade with the Lux pick in the last game. We'll see if he can do the same here on Azir. And in this matchup, we have seen both sides winning, and I'm not sure if that's because it's an even matchup. I'm not sure that's because there's been a significant skill discrepancy. It's always interesting to check on. Uh, this Azir versus Zareth matchup is these champions haven't seen any real balance changes. We're going to obviously jump to patch 5.1, maybe 5.2 in the upcoming weeks. I have a feeling this is not the last time we're going to see Azir versus Zareth in the mid. No, and a four-man turret are actually going to come in here. Love City and Looper could be in a whole host of trouble, and he does have the stun ready. Dreams is also off towards the top as well, so they are going to go in. Going to look for it. That's a good slow there from Death Action to Love City. Mako trying to line it up. They're going to be very careful, and they are going to go through. There's the blade coming in, but a good play there from Love City, and Death trying to run in. Mako actually in trouble there. The heal does come through. So good flash for Death. Clear that moving in as well. And that's not enough damage. No, the Gromp does get the kill after Death autos it and Leona gets credit for that kill. Yeah, they're still going with the dive here though, but they might have to back off. Very low health bars. Five members actually in this bottom lane. Yeah, Dada's come through, but that's a good knock up there by Pawn as well, but no real follow-up damage. Death gonna look for the cork, just missing the slow, but Pawn still coming with the damage out of mana though, and probably gonna have to give up the chase onto Dade. He's being very, very uh, patient on his heal and flash right here. Holds both his summons. Smart play from Dade. He managed to relieve a bit of pressure on the bottom lane there. But I think M3 are going to feel really hard done by to have anyone fall right there. The Gromp actually getting the execute on Lee And Dade actually uses his heal for lane sustain because he wants to stay in lane so badly right here. I mean, EDG did lose a lot of summoners in that trade and didn't get any objectives for it. So it's not the worst trade, actually. His mid lane, Dade, gets very low. But he's playing, as you said, with fire there in the mid lane. We'll finally go back now as Pawn's going to collect his CS out from under the turret. It was very surprising to see the heal used for lane stand. We're going to see the replay right here. It was very good pathing from Dreams to actually be there to relieve pressure because it would have been two kills right here. The rocker onto Grump from Death was very smart. Actually gives the kill credit over to Leona, which isn't ideal right here. But there's such high health on both Love CD 
and uh, Looper that they're going to feel hard done by having a death there because it was smart pathing but from Dreams to be in the bottom lane when he needed to be there. And it really was an over-aggressive dive coming out even from the tanky Nunu and Leona on yeah. the EDG side. At least they lost the minimum, I think, because maybe what M3 are going to take home there. And now we're actually going to swap back in to standard lane. So Deft has gone back. Actually, hasn't shopped yet. Never mind. Neither AD carry has. I'll never. Sorry, that's Annie. That's very confusing. Not quite so standard, but obviously the ranged flavor right there. Annie with support is going to farm just fine in a 2v2 lane. A lot of Lulu comparisons can be drawn there. As we saw a lot of Lulu with support in earlier patches when we saw a lot of offlane Lulu coming out. And the top lane, you could call this standard match because Corky top is a very respectable pick, has so much laning power, but interesting to see how Annie Thresh uh, performs in a 2v2 lane matchup. But this might be the best chance Looper's ever gotten to actually get some farm on this Annie, and that's been the biggest thing. He's been lane swapped on, he's been caught in horrible positions, and Annie's great with our items in the support role, but if you commit to giving someone farm like this Annie, you better have something to show for it, and so far M3 have never gotten Looper enough of the gold, so if he does get some, I'd be very curious to see what he does. I mean, the question that gives to me is, all right, he's got the gold. Let's say he has the 2,000 gold in the early game. What is he buying that helps him 1v1, a Nar and an offlane. That's the question I have is, he's not realistically going to be able to burst down Korra. Korra, okay, in another game, he might have gone for, say, a Snowball Phage or a Snowball Brutalizer. But in this game, he can very easily just itemize, say, a Hex Drinker, which gives him some offensive flavor and basically stops any assassination coming out from a even or even slightly ahead looper. And then they'll just kind of trade in the top lane. Nar has the range advantage. But okay, we could see a fight in the mid lane. Fancy footwork, just going in onto Dari. Good slow there, coming in the dive. Maybe going to come through Koras down here as well. Clearly, Voss will in position. He was there for point if he wanted to go deeper. The ulti actually coming out now as well, but won't get the kill. Dari just trying to get a little bit back there. And Pong with very slick moves almost gets the solo kill. Pong was definitely going for the exclamation solo kill on Dari right there. He knew that both Dari's summoners were down and will be down for a few minutes yet. Wasn't able to quite pick up the kill, but had the heal for insurance. Wasn't realistically going to fall. But this is kind of the flavor we're seeing. This is the person who picked up the jacket at Worlds. And he's going to try and keep it firmly on his shoulders. Yeah, he really wants to keep sending that message to Dari saying, hey, you're very good, but I might just be better. He had a great Lux game here in Azir, which is arguably, for me, the best I've seen in the LPL. And we see Deft's actually been rotated into the 1v1 against Looper in the top lane here. Of course, in rocket form, has such a trading advantage against Looper that until Looper hits 6, of course, doesn't have Ignite to secure a kill, so basically needs a, a half health or lower Deft. Not really a scenario that's going to happen in this laning matchup, you'd have to think. And very much helped by the fact that Deft, like you mentioned in the pregame, has already picked up that quick BF sword. Yeah, he's very, very strong here. Any sort of trading, he can go happily in a 1v1 or 2v2 lane in the bottom lane against Corky with all the extra wave clear he has with those rockets. But in this situation, Annie, of course, although she has a long-ranged auto, cannot trade orders against Death. Make her going in for the dive. Looper does get stunned after his flash. Love City will ride him out. The rocket just no, wide. Sorry, but Mako will get the kill. Now, Clearlove in the top lane going in for Love City. The hook does land down. Clearlove still taking turrets, though, but the Yeti is very tanky in the last death sentence. Will not complete. Mako with the double, actually, in the top, and Death gets a turret. Clearlove is so tanky on this Nunu, and that's what he does. He can't gank, but man, can he turret dive. Ate about four to five turret shots there. Deft with the BF stuff, like you pointed out, was able to get the execute with the Ignite running on Love CD. They pick up a second kill, and man, it goes from zero to real the fast lane for this EDG team. If we maybe want to look at Clearlove a bit here and just focus on how, like, what kind of player he is. That was actually Koro coming in onto Dreams. Good stunning pawn. That's an easy pick up there as well. So a bit of a misposition. Way too aggressive there for Ro. Yeah, Ro, or Dreams as he's named in this game, was trying for the aggressive steal because he saw all the pressure up top. Thought, all right, should be a free buff steal in the bottom lane here. Nothing is free against EDG. They have so many wards. Again, double side stone already completed. I mean, look at this. Oh, in the bottom lane, Candy's in trouble. Yeah, he's actually just slowing there with the Snowball Plus. That's Mike Cora going to come in for the damage, and there's more than enough from Mini now to take Candy out. So five kills to zero now for EDG, possibly even the Dragon coming up now as well. But no, my eyes were actually drawn to Death's items right here. A very early Snowball QSS. He can lane against this Annie with impunity right now. It's not just the magic resist, but being able to get away from the Tibber's burn, which is so much of that combo damage. How are you going to lock down this Deft? He's looking very safe. He has the BF, so they're going to pick up the first dragon here. And EDG strategically completely outplaying M3. And it's all that vision control again. I was trying to highlight it before. EDG picked up kill after kill. Dragon does go down. And Clearlove, as I said, you want to know what kind of player Clearlove is on this Nunu? He finished Sightstone before getting the Machete upgrade. Two games in a row, he had Machete into Sightstone. And what that gives him, of course, is the vision control. Of course, it relieves pressure off his lane lanes because the Lee Sin is going to be just sighted so much earlier. But on a simple level, that extra health, 
he's able to tank an extra turret shot. And that's that's his flavor of ganking as Nunu. He says, all right, let's get three people in a lane and turret dive away. Yeah, and Clearlove has actually been... For me, Clearlove is the, the engineer of really beautiful ganks in China. He's maybe not the strongest pressure drunk, he's a little more passive. Some people have, you know, maybe called him a herbivore for a bit of the Cloud Templar throwback. But for me, if Clearlove is good at one thing, it's getting his team together and ganking a lane. He's just a very, very experienced player that knows how to win games. When World Elite and now EDG were at their best, in the late game, you almost never saw them lose a team fight because he's an excellent team fighter. They just kind of got lost in early game rotations, but they're the ones making the rotations now with this new lineup. Maybe the new brains trust of Deft and Pawn coming into this lineup from Samsung has helped them out because Clearlove's looked a million bucks. Yeah, I mean, Engineer Clearlove and the rest of his team have looked amazing so far. And again, this is a big opportunity for EDG to open up a lead in the standings and take first for the first time ever in this split. We see Dade and Love City, they're looking for a gank on a Pawn. Dade will move in, does though the sun. That's a beautiful juke from Pawn though. The slow comes in a little late. Pawn's going to make some space for himself. Gets out with you. Love City grabs him though, and that's all five M3, no four of them there in the mid, and there's a kill under, uh, under Pawn. You thought there'd be enough pick potential from Lee Sin and and Thresh, but then you come in with the Annie Tibbers also. It's the exclamation point on top. Finally able to get that kill on Pawn, get him back to the out of the rift, but. Zareth, look, he's very competitive in CS right here, but this game is being played around mid lane. It doesn't matter what happens in mid lane because they're winning so far out in both top and bot lane. Yeah, and we're going to see three EDG members move in as well. That's bad news for Dada. He gets snared up by the Trumpers and the Snowball, and Death's going to clean in that kill very easily. Yeah, with the large model size, able to stand on top of the lantern right there, not able to get away to safety. Another kill comes in for EDG. Yeah, and Death now with the BF sword has a long sword as well to kind of complement some of the other damage he's doing, but really just a lot of early flat AD for Death looking to pressure as many lanes as possible. Yeah, and of course that QSS for the safety, it's allowing him to split against anybody. There's no pick pressure onto Death whatsoever with the QSS. He even has both his summoners available. And just with that early flat AD and the minigun, able to really train down these turrets. Yeah, you can see Dreams just does not want to contest at all. Really can't realistically. Does pick up the cannon with a Q, which is very cute, but Deft is just like, you know what? My team's getting gold. I'm happy with the turret. Pawn's actually rotated down. I'm just going to farm in the bottom lane. Yeah, whenever they have this Nunu, you know they're going to go for the smart rotational plan. With three out of turrets, six one up in kills, already a 5,000 plus gold lead. Counter flash. That crazy. That was amazing by Deft. He predicted Dreams to come in with the flash, put the chompers down, and then flashed out of the way so he couldn't get kicked. And that's what they brought into this team, Pastry Time. We always talked about how wonderful player Name was, especially in domestic games, but Deft is just as every bit as good. You can say that again as Koro in the top lane now on his nose. Just casually farming again. If this is a series where Koro has a low impact, that's probably bad news for a team. Absolutely. I mean, Koro has been the cornerstone of a lot of EDG's victories, but it's almost an auxiliary player. He's almost a supporting name in this EDG cast, at least in this series right here. It is going to be the Merlonomicon coming through from Looper, but in the down in the bot lane, Pawn's in trouble. Yeah, the teleports here. Flash can't get him out of the stun. Pawn gets played back as well. Can he kill away? A good ult there onto Looper, but Dada gets the kill with the ulti. Looper gets out as well, and Corey cannot chase further forward. The tower there proving a little bit of defense, but that's a good kill for M3. And then when the teleports are on board, when they have the aggressive wards down, you can see the power of this Annie pick. Whenever that ultimate comes up, 20% cooldown reduction, it's going to be very frequent. They are getting the picks on the map, but they're not picking up objectives, and the fight's on. Dreams caught now as well. Does get stunned up by Mako. The ulti was thrown out there by Leona. Lantern and clear love trying to get in the way, but can't block it up. Pops his ulti, but a little late there for that one. Dreams off to safety. Yeah, but they will pick up the objective here, and that's the difference between the picks we see from M3. Very successful in getting kills, but not objectives. They do not have one objective on this map whatsoever, and every time EDG pick up an objective, it's minimum a blue buff, it's minimum a red buff. If not, Dragon or more. Yeah, and that's how EDG love to play. They'll take their 5,000 gold lead here as well. Next Dragon buck up in a minute 35. Sun Turret does fall, so M3 will get that for themselves. But Candy just here with Love City trying to farm up. We see what happens when the Corky gets the early Trinity Force, and Candy's doing okay there, actually. And look, Candy has been a deft hand in most, most of his games. No pun intended on that one. He's been very, very capable right here. We're kind of seeing the return of Dade uh, going for the very early Magi's right here. He's... Um, He's known to do this in games when they're very far behind. We actually saw this at the uh, World Championships when they were losing to Samsung White. Of course, they lose, went on to lose 3-0 against Samsung White right here. I kind of understand the theory in that, look, if they do pick up a few snowball um, kills, maybe they won't get an objective out of it. But maybe they'll get an over-tuned AP carry in the mid lane, but... It's almost resigning yourself to a lucky fight this early in the game. I mean, for me, it's you know very reminiscent of a do or die playstyle here. I think for that, I'm just going to call it do or die because that's exactly what that is from the mid lane.
Yeah, do or die indeed. In the top lane, the loop is going in on Koro. Yeah, Koro though bounces out to safety, will be okay. Tibbers was popped already by Looper, actually, just kind of chasing through some minions, but the rest of the rotation's coming in depth. Gets kicked back there, but he has double loss. Pawn looking for, looks like an ulti potentially can EQ up. Good stun there, actually landing onto two. And there's Pawn coming in with the damage. Death throws the rocket in for the first kill onto Dreams. And again, EDG on top of the rotation. There's a huge solar flare from Maker right there. There's actually a flash solar flare just to pick up an exit kill right there. Of course, with that reset, able to get excited Death and get in position to get some more kills. They take away the red buff. You saw them claim the blue buff a moment ago. A kill, and there goes another objective. The red buff got no buffs available to M3 right here. And look, they have a turret, but it's a sun turret. They're going to have a real hard time picking up any true structures this yeah, game. Ward's getting knocked down there as well by EDG. They clean out the topside jungle of wards and rotate in towards the dragon. Going to look for their second one here. And Pawn actually going to jump in for a pit. Candy gets also back there. Clear love. Going to maybe pop in with the Nunu as well. The Lancer will keep him safe, but M3 cannot contest this dragon. And Def's gone for such a defensive build. The Bloodthirst to end the QSS available right here. He just wants to stay in alive and fights. Maybe he realizes that with the Leona support, there's not a lot of peel for him right here. It's going to be engaged. Oh, and my goodness. Darde snipes the dragon. Clear love. No consume coming anywhere. So he'll have to put up with the consolation scuttle crab. Well, if you're going to pick up an objective one way, at least do it with a bit of style. And Darde tries to get his team back into the game. The Magi is definitely no Magi stacks for that kill, but a big boost in power for his teammates. I mean, he'll take it. M3 are going to be happy to have a dragon under their belt that will stymie a little bit of the snowball here, but Def still looking strong. And you mentioned the BT. For me, this build might be unacceptable if he just wasn't so fed. Well, it's just a case that he doesn't have a lot of peel. Leona's going to be going in. He doesn't have a supportive support like, say, Janna, for example. He's in a lot of Janna jinx. Because if Janna can sit back, stand next to the jinx, shield her up, make sure he's doing plenty of damage, and then apply disengage. She has no real disengage here, barring Clearlove. And Clearlove's focusing on being on the front line. We've seen him tanking turrets rather than standing next to his mate Deft in the back line. So it makes a lot of sense to go for a very defensive build right here because he realizes, all right, I'm probably going to have to position very defensively in fights, but I've got so much self-peel, you could say, with the QSS and now the BT shield that I'm just that much more tanky. And by the time they rip through me, Pawn's going to kill the whole team. Yeah, I mean, good for pushing as well as the BT. EDG, this build for Deft here just feels like it fits... The, what's happening in this game and how they've chosen to play it. And that is, that is the sign of a very smart player. I mean, Deft was always one to be ahead of the meta in terms of builds. You know, when he, when he was brought out Lucian, he was the first real Lucian player in competitive play. If it was first the Trinity Force, then he would change builds and build up the Bloodthirst. So he's in the Trinity Force Varus. He'll always play, play around with champion strengths. And his build will be based on the comp he's in and the comp he's facing rather than just a personal preference. And that's the sign of a smart player. If you're ever rigid in your builds, you lose the chance to take advantage of a unique situation. And in this one with poor peel, I do like the very defensive focus. The snowball QSS, strange idea, but when you're going to be offlaning against an Annie, makes so much sense. Yeah, what do you think of the Last Whisper that's likely looking to come out here as well? It's kind of the Legolas build we used to see with BT plus Last Whisper. I mean, it's all about sitting in the back, being very safe in your positioning, getting that ultimate off, a first kill coming out, and then being able to use that passive to do damage. So while you don't have the damage modifiers like the attack speed and critical strike, you're just hoping that you can trade on the fact that, all right, I'll always be in position for that last rocket because there's going to be so many front-loaded kills in this fight. Yeah, we'll have to see very smart stuff from Deft and EDG continue to play their way around this map. About 6,000 gold ahead or so at this particular stage here. Baron up for the first time in a minute 20. We saw an early Baron last game from EDG. Looks like they might have that option again here in this one. I think the very important thing for M3 is actually get a bit of AP onto Dade, but in top lane we see a bit of engage going on in the bot lane, so much pressure being applied by EDG. Yeah, EDG will form in at the top, but Koro knocks him out, Dreams will follow him in, that's a good wallop though, maybe you're going to save him and Mini Nar now with a bit of hyper speed, Dreams going to come in, the boomerang's good, that is going to be the kill, but will Dreams go down as well, safeguards away, Tim is taking the turret and that's very well played. But in the bot lane, the rotation is very successful at EDG, they do pick up the tur outer turret right there, so that's Basically, all outer turrets barring the top outer turret down for EDG. They will get an answering turret, but taking an outer turret for an inner is not a big win for M3. You know, Pawn as well, kind of getting his build chugging along. Def, we already talked at length about his build, but an early stinger here for Pawn following that Athene's going to look to move into his first big item, probably a Zonia's or Rabadon's death cap. Yeah, he's definitely going to move on to a big item right there. We see already the Aegis is completed on Nunu right here for just a bit more insurance. So much magic was just actually available. And Looper, he likes to teleport out as well. Yeah, he's uh, going to pull a Koro from last game. Or maybe it was this game, actually, where he was looking to get Tower Dive. Koro also teleporting, interestingly, and Baron is getting looked at by EDG. I think we saw some red pings. So they have some idea that they're looking to 20-minute rush down Baron. 
I mean, Deft is up towards the top. He may be going to rotate in, going to push the wave out, give them more vision there. Pawn already in the mid, controlling that wave as well. And 20 minutes on the dot. No, Baron is up now. And EDG not going to look for it yet, but they've got so much vision around the top side of the map. One thing I think EDG's noticed is that with this early Magi's pick, Dade has delayed his needlessly large run. It's when you get that first CDR item into the needlessly large run that you can actually really instantly wave clear as a Zer. If you notice, as, sorry, Zerath, as you notice here, whenever he queues a minion wave, there's lots of minions living on a few hundred HP. It's not got instant wave clear. And M3 just can't control waves at the moment. Yep, EDG, they're going to give up that very early Baron, at least for now, and try and pressure up towards the top side of the map first. So, going to be fairly patient here. Pawn actually checking things out. We'll aggro up the red buff, which may look to be a steal here. In fact, Clear of Deft and Mako are already around the buff. So, that's going to go over to Deft, it looks like, at M3. Just losing everything off their map. Towers, buffs, you name it. And let's return to a topic that we haven't discussed today, but it's been so important in the LPL, which, of course, is wave control. One of the important things about getting this outer ring of turrets down is that you can set up a slow push and actually force the enemy to react to the pressure your minions are causing. You look in the bot lane here, still the bot outer turret up at 20 minutes into the game. So even though they have massive minion waves pushing into the bottom lane here, M3 are not able to create any map control. The sixth man is being hamstrung in the bottom lane here from pushing down and causing pressure. And this means that EDG can just set up camp in the M3 top jungle, put down the wards, and basically, the moment they feel confident in it, rush down that Baron. Yeah, Corey down the bottom could even get that slow push going for his team if they wanted to. They've got so many turrets down on the bottom side of the map. It would basically take M3 forever to get over to the Baron if that's what EDG want to do. And Corey, now in Megan Alpha, I'm going to have to maybe wait for the next team fight if they do want to go in. But EDG, once again, just in complete control of the game. It makes it so fast on your rotations if you had to teleport down to top, even walk down to bottom lane in this case push up the wave, and it's always going to be held just outside your outer turret, so quick to push it in, and then you can look to group and push your advantages. And when you have that instant reaction of being able to cause an advantage in the bottom and then just teleport and win a team fight in the top, it's just a wonderful spot to be in for EDG. Yeah, and the wave clear on the EDG side with the Depth Rockets coming in for Jinx. Now with the Last Whisper done, pretty immense. Berserker Groove's done as well. Dragon is up again, looking for a second here for EDG. They did have that misstep and lose the first one. That's pretty rare for Nunu to lose a buff, but I don't think Clear is going to lose this. Oh, Tati's at it again. Going to pop the ulti, and EDG actually going to respect it and will wait it out. Oh, and Pawn in the mid there as well. Gets the solo kill onto Dreams, and that will secure the Dragon. Yeah, caught Dreams in transition right there. They will get the uncontested Dragon to to end it all up, but I mean, if I had to give a sub name to this series, it'd be a tale of two corkies, just because we saw how big Deft was, how great that EDG were able to use the rotations in that first game. Look at Corky right here. He's hit his power spike. Trinity Force, Sorcerer's Shoes, maybe a minute too late, but still very competitively. But they've never been able to group with that Corky and take any structures or any advantage. They've got a top turret that was completely a turret dive from Annie, and the other turret's a sun turret. So they're never able to group with a Corky. And if you're not grouping around a power spike, and EDG are picking up three uncontested barons right here. No point in picking Corky. Yeah, I mean, it's not just the fact that you've spent the gold. It's the fact you have to make good use of it as well. And Def, by the way, is up about 2,000 gold on that lane as well. Looper actually almost caught out backing off screen right there. Has to flash away because he was backing under turret. So three people with Baron, especially a Mega Nar show up, got scared and flashed away. Yeah, Pawn feels very comfortable. Going to push in the mid wave with his Baron up creep here as well. Looks like that's a catch. And Mako actually going to go down. That's a catch for M3. Now EDG going to look in. Def does dodge the stun. Good trumpet positioning as well. He's got to be so careful. That's an amazing Q assessed by Def. But Annie follows in with a kill. And Def does flash. But Dada gets that one. And there the stacks are now going to come through. Dreams looking to follow in onto clear the foot. Maybe going to snipe Corey here as well. Nara is pretty low. Good bounce there out from the Q of Lee Sin. And looks like Pawn's going to rotate in now as well. Dade pops the ulti there. Does a little bit of poke damage, but a rare misstep from EDG. It was excellent assertive play from M3 initiating when they knew that Pawn was completely split from his team right there. Not able to control any space. Completely split away. You saw him put out the Sand Soldier. Only doing one auto attack in that fight. Pawn was completely irrelevant, so even though it was a wonderful QSS on the death sentence, so much more targeted CC coming out from Annie meant a very dead death. Yep, and Pawn has set up a target for himself, going to apply a bit more pressure with his Baron buff as well. Koro looks to be rotating down towards the bottom side of the map as well, so going to pick up the big collection of minions that have kind of sat themselves there in the bottom side. Sun turret goes down again, so M3 do have a, an actual turret for themselves this game. I think that's two Sun turrets they've killed, and again going to get aggressive. This is what, the sixth buff that's been stolen? 
Yeah, the buffs are definitely not been M3s. They've been EDGs and they've been on loan to M3. And there's the Solar Flare. Good stun there. Koro moving in as well. Mega now gets two into the wall. Paul gets Dada dead with him with the rocket. And Clearly gets an easy follow-up kill onto Dreams. Yeah, the deletion potential right there. You see the power of the Legolas build we've seen from Deft right here. He was one of the first to do it on Varus. He would always experiment with different builds. He understands that he's basically an auxiliary artillery right here. I thought Zerath would be the true artillery this game. And look, he stole a dragon, but... Those rockets are doing massive damage from yeah, there. Yeah, and these towers are melting under the death minigun as well. Just shreds through the structures. And he's going to go down at 25 minutes here in M3, battling back from what is now going to be very soon a 10,000 gold lead. Another bad spot for M3. They couldn't do it in game one, and it'll be one hell of a miracle if they do it here. And on review, it's just one of those situations where you just compare EDG's picks with the advantages they get from them and M3's picks from the advantages they can get from them. They haven't got an outer. They've just got, the, I believe, their second outer turret maybe right here in the bottom lane. So they have got another one on the board. But it's never been grouping with Corgi. It's never been grouping with their power spikes. So their timings have been completely irrelevant. And, you know, even though we talk about mid-game spikes, there was no mid-game spike because EDG ran the whole early game so well it just was irrelevant whatever items Corky came up with. And that's the sign of a good team is to recognize, all right, how do we win? But also, what are they looking to do? And if you're stymieing what the enemy team's looking to do, pushing their timers back, but also being assertive and getting advantages yourself, very easy to win a game of League of Legends that way. And that observation, which was beautiful, by the way, can simply be summed up with the control. EDG have just been in control of this game pretty much for the entire time, and even in game one as well. This series belongs to them, and they can feel the ladder points that they could win here as well. Remember, nine possible points here for EDG that they can take. They'll get their first three here if they can 2-0 M3. And again, EDG kind of living in M3's jungle. It seems like they've been doing so for about 10 minutes. And we revisit that Annie pick. Not really seeing the impact of Annie in the top lane right here. Going for the Zonya's second, so obviously going to be about hard committing with the Flash maybe, and then flashing it with the Tibbers into Zonya's. I can understand the theory behind it, but just one Koro Megana ultimate seems to negate anything that has been seen from Looper so far this series. Yeah, and Koro, when I mean, we talk about his Naren, how strong it is, he's been such a good team fighter. Hasn't really been needed with the way that EDG have been playing uh, this last two games with basically the Nunu as a way to control and then Pawn and Def just really helping with all of the rotational play. Mako as well, been on point with Leon of both these games. Yeah, the flash uh, into the ultimate, the solar flare, was probably one of the highlights of the game so far. Another outer turret force. That's all the outer turrets down and three right here and Dade he's got the death cap now so he has a bit of wave clear but if he'd spent that 1400 gold on just more sheer AP maybe if he's very close to a void stuff he'd have both the long range assassination potential of the ultimate and he would have had the wave clear that much earlier the waves have been so aggressively pushed into M3's base because they couldn't be instantly clear they didn't have the AP on Xerath early enough and M3 haven't been able to make those stacks work. Yeah, and Pawn has had another stellar game. He does have his own Rabadon's death cap now as well. So that is he going to be doing mountains of damage right now. Dragon back up in 45. Koro trying to manage his rage. will actually push out this wave just a little further in towards the top side of the map. Get a bit more space here for M3. Does transform into Mega Nabo. By the time that Dragon comes back up, Koro should have plenty of rage left over. Worth knowing that Deft has actually skipped finishing his uh, zeal item right here. Of course, he knows that he has Blood Boil coming from Clear Love. At the moment, clear. I've only got two points into that, but of course, giving so many attacks, uh, effective attack speed stats and the movement speed right there, he's effectively getting Phantom Dancer like procs. Of course, not with the same critical chance. And he's able to just go into sheer AD to ensure that ultimate's going to be hitting for massive damage. Yeah, Looper is not having, not enjoying this. Deft actually good. Zonya's coming in, puts the chompers in. Deft wants a solo kill very badly, does the cure it, gets excited and runs out. What a play by Deft. Knowing the limits of his champion inside and out, I believe he's 100% on the jinx here so far. Uh, Deft, and you can see why. Yeah, Dreams going in. The QSS popped in there, though. And Dreams, nothing he can do. His team peeling from beautifully. Pawn just running defense with the Sand Soul as well. Mako tanking the turret forever there. And now Dadi's in a whole host of trouble going down to Pawn. Koro in the back as well as Megana does get hooked towards the fountain. Will not get pulled in towards it. And that might just be game EDG. Yeah, they're motoring down turrets right here. They're going to try and finish it out. Pawn's actually more interested in trying to pick up some exit kills and the turret right here, but EDG strategically so on point right here. They know what their goal is. Their par for this week, it's not six points, it's not seven points, it's all nine points. And on this form, shouldn't be too difficult. Yeah, and what an another stellar game by EDG, swapping it up a bit. We talked about Def being big carry, a big carry here for his team. Pawn played fantastically as well. And for me, it's just looking at those games, there's similar elements for EDG, but the fact that Def ran Corky and then Jinx, two very different carries back to back, and EDG still managed to pull off a very well executed game plan, just speaks to me about how strong this team looks right now. Yeah, both their two Korean imports, both their carries, you'd have to say, between the mid and AD carry, 
they can play both ways. They can play very defensive champions and grind it out to late game, but they can also play very aggressive champions and go for that mid-game snowball right there. And Clearlove on the Nunu has so much potential to really be impressive, to put on that pressure, and EGG, they find their timers, they know the enemy timers, and they make sure there's no chance for M3 to ever get into these games. Yeah, and fantastic looking play there. That match is over. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be back with more LPL action as World Elite looking for points against Energy Pacemaker.